talking about Philippine hazards, focusing here in our country, and how science and technology is used for CCA DRR. DRR stands for Disaster Risk Reduction. Okay? And CCA, uh, Climate Change Adaptation. We have an area of about 300,000 square kilometers land area. Uh, and its location is the prime target for hazards. No? We are in the Pacific Ring of Fire and we are in the Typhoon Belt. Uh, climatological effects of El Nino and La Nina and the Southwest Monsoon, yung tinatawag natin na habagat. When there's a typhoon in the eastern part of the Philippines, it gives vitamins to the rain clouds in the South China Sea or the West Philippine Sea. So parang nagiging mas malakas yung hangin, tapos mas marami yung ulan doon sa western part. And it has caused flooding events in Metro Manila. And here I show you, since 1948 or 1949, there have been a lot of typhoons that have entered in the Philippine area of responsibility. So each line that, uh, that you are seeing represents the track of a typhoon since 1948. So we're just in 1972, uh, counting, the, counting to uh, year 2000. You can see that of all the tracks, no? if you combine all of these tracks, Mindanao, uh, Mindanao is not that well covered, but Visayas and Luzon are very well covered. No? And because there are not many typhoons in Mindanao, uh, there's less damage to agricultural crops. Uh, there's less damage to crops. And that's pro probably one of the reasons why Mindanao is the, the fruit basket no, of, of the Philippines. And uh, you can see that of all of these typhoons, ano ba yung mga associated hazards? No? The, the typhoon is not the, it's not the hazard, it's the phenomenon. What uh, kills people are the strong winds that can uh, rip off the, the roof of houses, make trees fall down, and when you get hit, you die. Diba? Uh, it's the floods. When pag nalunod kayo, you die. No? That's the hazard. So the typhoon is not really, or the cyclone is not the, the hazard. It's the landslide that is triggered by the excessive rainfall. Okay? Uh, that's the hazard. Tapos, storm surges. You've heard of storm surge, right? It happened in, in, in the central Philippines region. Aside from uh, being the typhoon belt ng Pacific, we're also in the Pacific Ring of Fire. No? So all of these yellow and green ones and red uh, areas okay, are actually earthquake epicenters that have been plotted on a map. No? Not all earthquakes happen just anywhere. No? They, they happen in specific zones. And in the area of the Pacific, surrounding the Pacific, you have a lot of earthquakes happening. It's based on the historical record of earthquakes. No? And because it surrounds the Pacific, and also because these places where earthquakes occur around the Pacific are associated with many volcanoes, no? and volcanoes are associated with fire. Diba yung lava, it's very, very hot. That's the reason why it's called the Pacific Ring of Fire. It's surrounding the Pacific Ocean. No? So the countries surrounding the Pacific Ocean experience a lot of earthquakes and there are volcanoes. And again, the, the eruption itself is the phenomenon. The earthquake itself is the phenomenon. No? So the hazards associated with the uh, earthquake are yung collapse of a building na dadaganan kayo. The ground shaking or the earthquake itself, if you're no, in an open field, you will not die. No? It's the hazard. So pag nag-shaking, it will make the, the building uh, unstable. It, if it collapses, you die. No? So these are the hazards. Other hazards associated with earthquakes are uh, tsunamis. No? So if the tsunami happens, you get buried or you get uh, flooded, in your area and you can't swim and there's a wave that brings you and gets your head to, to hit a, a wall, then you die. So volcanoes, in volcanic eruption, eh, you don't get killed, no? especially if you're far away. But if you're near, uh, uh, lava 
Okay? If you're near the volcanic eruption and you come in contact with lava and it surrounds your house, you'll die from the excessive heat. Those are the hazards. No? Uh, we have to deal with the hazards. We know that these phenomena that bring forth the hazards will always be here, but we need to be uh, aware of what these hazards really are. But in order to understand the hazards, we also must understand the phenomena. No? So this is where science comes in. The Philippines is the third most vulnerable country in the world to natural hazards. Name it, we have it, except for hazards associated with snow. Marami tayong hazards, and at the same time, there are a lot of people that are exposed to that hazard. And these people don't have enough capacity to be able to address the hazard. No? Kasi one of the reasons probably is they are, they are persons with disabilities, or they are poor, and they don't understand, they are not aware. And that increases what we call as risk. No? So you have the hazard, people are exposed, and these people are, are, are vulnerable. No? Parang their capacity to address the hazard is not that good. And therefore, if you combine all of them, it leads to our understanding of disaster risk. One manifestation of that, uh, of that uh, high risk is probably your poor awareness or your poor understanding of the hazards in our country. Do you agree? Huh? Do you know of the hazards in our country? Some. There are about more than 20. Can you, can you name all of them? No, sir. Do you know the hazards in this area? Probably not. Probably not. No? So you are uh, college students, no? and uh, if you don't know all, no? so what more the people who don't study? Diba? So you can just imagine that we really need to build, build awareness. No? so as to reduce the risk. The risk. And one manifestation also of uh, that high vulnerability and high uh, risk is that we have been experiencing disasters. So these are the hazards. No? We have pyroclastic flow associated with vo uh, volcanic hazards, pyroclastic flow, debris avalanche, lahar, lava, tsunami, noxious gas, fire, landslides, ground subsidence, liquefaction, ground rupture, collapse of structures, earthquake generated tsunami, floods, storm surge, strong winds, rain induced landslides. So there are so many hazards. Are you prepared for each of these hazards? In the Philippines, uh, of all the types of hazards, the number one are are, are those that are associated with cyclones and extreme weather. No? Like floods and storms, these are the blue and the red ones. No? So you can see that from 1970s up to the decade from 2000 to 2009, it's really the floods and storms that uh, cause a lot of damage no? because they, they, they come in several times a year. No? So in a year, about 20 cyclones enter the Philippine area of responsibility. And in Luzon and Visayas, there are about six to seven that make landfall. In, the, in Mindanao, there are about less than one on average per year. Distribution of natural disasters, you can see that floods and storms are the most uh, reported. Just to give you an idea of what kind of disasters have happened in the Philippines, this is one uh, that happened in 2009, a massive landslide. The technical term is called a debris avalanche. No? This ridge, okay, that ridge, which is uh, about 700 meters high, okay, 700 meters high, rocks there collapsed and flowed down no? uh, en masse and developed a landslide footprint which was 4 kilometers long and 1.5 kilometers wide. And the town of Ginsaugon was buried. No? And that town had a population of 1,857. So this is the 700 meter ridge. It went down. That is about 4 kilometers, 1.5 kilometers wide. And the town of Ginsaugon was buried under uh, 30 meters of rubble. 
Many people died. Fatality is 1,226, missing 980, bodies recovered 139, treated for injuries, those who died in the hospital too. And they were trying uh, to find that elementary school, no? which was buried, supposedly buried under 30 meters of rubble. It was a 2,000 man strong search and rescue team composed of the U.S. Navy, U.S. Marines, Philippine Army, miners, volunteers, so 2,000 strong with people from Taiwan, with search and rescue dogs, Spain, uh, uh, Singapore, Japan. They all tried to contribute. Even uh, people from the academe tried to locate that school because there were text messages uh, on the second day, up to the second day that for 250 or nearly about that number were still inside the elementary school so they were trying to search uh, frantically for that with back hose no? and you can see that they were trying to dig up all sorts of places because they did not know where that school was located anymore. There was no landmark to locate the, the school. So they were just kept, they just kept on digging, uh, guessing where the school was. No? And just to give you an idea how big that landslide was, uh, that backhoe is this one. The backhoe in the yellow backhoe is that one. Laken, diba? So how can you search for a buried school with 200 plus children if the landslide is that big. Maybe we need a little bit of science there. What we did was uh, we tried to go up the, on board the helicopters, take pictures, and then try to stitch the photographs and try to figure out using a geographic information system where the, uh, the, the recovered uh, person, uh, uh, personal effects uh, and then uh, we tried to, to, to put in place and find out where the original location of the, of the school was or the town. And there was also a GPS point that was available because they were trying to you know, figure out, or they were trying to measure the, the fault because it was near the Philippine fault. They were trying to measure the fault and that GPS, you, you know what the GPS is, right? Well, had a millimeter scale accuracy. So that GPS point was only provided on the seventh day. Why? Because uh, when we asked for it from government agencies, they said that we are not part of government. So they only gave it on the seventh day. So that is where uh, some things need to be in place no? so that uh, we, it can be ensured that uh, these scientific data are available so that during times of emergencies they can be used. Enough with bureaucracy. And in the same year, in 2006, there, were, there was this lahar, no? uh, debris that was flowing no? at uh, rates of about 10 to 50, 60 kilometers per hour. Uh, which cascaded down the slopes of Mayon Volcano and killed nearly 2,000 people. Buried a lot of houses and one characteristic of that is that uh, there are big boulders on top, no? uh, strewn uh, in the debris field. We call uh, that kind of phenomenon as a lahar. A lot of people died in Ginobatan because of the lahars, Kamalig, Daraga, Bonga, Padang, and Basud. No? And the reason why they died is because they were caught by surprise. They thought that they were not uh, sufficiently far from the river. So they were here. They thought that they were sufficiently far. But what happened was that the river, okay, that's the original course of the river. Uh, there were dikes that breached upstream. So this dike here, that dike here breached and they were caught by surprise and they were overwhelmed by the lahars okay and also in that part now this is a picture of uh, the impacts of tropical uh, frack you know, that hit Iloilo and this picture reminds us that floodplains which are the areas beside the river which we claim as ours is not really 
ours. No? It's part of the river. So when there are big floods, the river reclaims this land called as floodplains, the, the, the flat part beside the rivers. And you can see that the river, instead of uh, get, uh, following that course, just went down straight. And those are floodplains that was or that were reclaimed by the river because it's it's theirs. So there was also another big flood event uh, in 2011, Kandaba. You can see this Pampanga River, which is about 50 meters wide, or maybe up to 100. But when the floods came in, the river swelled from 50 to 100 meters. It became as wide as as what? 10 kilometers. No? Naging 10 kilometers from here to there. So you can see the, the force of nature. No? Um, sometimes it can be really overwhelming if the phenomenon or if the hazard is extreme. And no amount of intervention or structural intervention can stop it. We'll just waste money trying to stop it because the force of nat nature is well beyond what we can do or what we can design. You see the Pampanga River, which is this one, but the floods really go all the way as thick as, as wide as 10 kilometers. And then, then there was the Sendong disaster in 2011. Uh, there was a, a flood, the river swelled. This is a floodplain, they have claimed it as theirs. And when the floods came in, they happen once every 100 years or once every 200 years. But when they come, they can devastate the whole area within that flood plain. And uh, that is what happened in Mandulog River in Iligan, wherein thousands of people died. You know? There was this community, an informal settlement uh, composed of about 500 uh, uh, shanties. You know? And all I saw was uh, uh, an area full of sand. In that same place, Orchid's Home Subdivision, just beside that informal settlement, was this uh, subdivision, relatively upscale. Um, and when the floods came in, it was reduced to a pile of rubble. Huh? So this is how the impacts of hazards affect our communities. And they happen almost every year. And it creates so much loss and damage you know, that it runs up to, the bi to billions of pesos. And if it happens every day, how can we develop? How can we progress? And how can our economy uh, sustain that rise if each and every year we lose a lot from the impacts of hazards? That means that we need to do something about it. Of course, in Tacloban, this is the most uh, famous uh, probably of all the hazards because it's touted to be the one of the strongest or in fact the strongest cyclone that has ever made landfall. Uh, that's, that's what it is known to be. And it created storm surges and these storm surges uh, killed a lot of people. Um, and of course in 2013 we also had that just a month before Yolanda uh, struck there was this uh, <coughs> earthquake creating a rupture on the ground, and that rupture was several kilometers long, three meters high, a, a wall similar to that. You can see the person for scale, and that didn't previously uh, exist. No, it was just flat ground. This was was continuous with this, but when it it ruptured, it generated that Bohol earthquake in 2013, killing hundreds of people, and that. Uh, that uh, wall is quite rare no? uh, by world standards because not all earthquakes generate such a feature. So what the governor did was he tried to convert that, uh, that uh, disaster into something that they could earn from as uh, a tourism. Since it was uh, 6 to 7 kilometers long and it was high and it was a rare event, no? He called it the Great Wall of Bohol. No? So that's, that's ingenuity. No? I'm trying to find something, uh, make it a source of livelihood from a disaster event. No? So we can, we can do that. No? We have to innovate. 
we have to be uh, thinking all the time to find ways to to solve the impacts, uh, solve the the harsh impacts of, of disasters. And more recently, in 2017, we have this map showing that community as exposed to hazards, but you know uh, this map was not used. That means that uh, we need we need to go out there and bring the science to the communities, to the barangays. So are you willing to volunteer and go to the barangays in Tawi-Tawi or in Marawi or, you know, to teach them of all of these hazard maps, to show them uh, where the safe areas are and where uh, the dangerous areas are? We need people to share all of this information. And we try to use uh, all kinds of media platforms like Twitter, like Facebook, like the internet to teach people, but it's not enough. There, there needs to be some kind of engagement. You know? And if they see young people, students from FEU going down to them, they feel that they are loved. You know? And they engage, they talk to you. And when they talk to you, they get more aware of the disasters. You know? So that is what we need. So if you can organize people, uh, to mainstream all of the scientific information down to barangay level, that would be best. There are many, many, many laws no, that are related to disaster risk reduction. Please visit the site. Okay, that's a map of the Philippines. You can see the satellite information, the clouds, uh, the, the red, yellow, and white clouds refer to rain. So you can see the Philippines uh, and the vicinities where it rains. Uh, it also shows the Pag-asa track. No need to read the advisories uh, every six hours. There are rainfall sensors deployed all over the country that stream data every 15 minutes. Either you can look at them one by one or uh, just uh, look at the map and see where it's raining. So like for example, if it's raining here, uh, you know that that watershed will experience flooding. And when there's that kind of information, you must know where to go. The red places are uh, areas of floods. So, these are crowdsourced information to validate the simulated floods. And then we also have landslide hazard maps for the entire country shown at high resolution. 
And for debris flows, so that people can avoid the debris flows, those ones that uh, uh, I showed, storm surges as well. You know? So all over the Philippines, the fifth longest coastline, we have storm surge inundation maps. And it's available for any part of the country. Unfortunately, the floods are not yet complete. But for landslides and storm surges, they're complete. So you can plot exposed areas like schools, like uh, uh, where dengue happens, police stations, uh, etc., hospitals, and see whether these infrastructure or these institutions are at risk from a particular type of hazard. Like, for example, these areas, uh, they must be aware, these schools must be aware that there's a chance that they will get flooded. Okay? They must know the risk if they don't want to get out in that place. 